Most of us intuitively think that what we perceive as being real is real. In other words, what we hear, see and feel is a true reflection of reality. However, that's not quite the case. And in this video, I'm going to cover the main way that our brain processes information and some of the main ways that our mind tricks us every day. This includes why we sometimes make rash decisions and why we often jump to the wrong conclusion. These are called cognitive biases and blind spots. And the main reasons why you should learn about them is one, it helps you understand your own mind better. And two, it kind of forms like a psychological form of self-defense where you're less likely to be exploited or manipulated using them. Just a quick note, this video is partly based on the excellent work of Dr. Daniel Kahneman and his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. So the main place to start is that our mind or brain doesn't just consist of one discrete unit. Instead, it's made up of a series of different systems. Broadly speaking, and for the purposes of this video, we're gonna cover two primary systems, which we will name System 1 and System 2, as mentioned in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. System 1 is effectively your fast brain, and System 2 is your slow brain. What I mean by this is that System 1 is intuitive and automatic, and it's constantly scanning your environment to pick up pieces of information and to assess threat. System 2 is your slow brain, not because it's less capable, but because it only comes into effect when it's really needed, and this is usually to deal with problems that your System 1 can't deal with. System 2 is usually known for its precision and in-depth problem solving, which usually requires conscious effort. So why is this important? Well, basically, every day we come across various problems, all the way from who is this person standing in front of me, all the way to what is the best mode of transport that you can use to get home from work. As I mentioned before in previous videos, your brain is basically a problem solving organ. So it's constantly trying to figure out new problems and come up with various solutions. But because the world is a very complicated place, we don't have the time nor energy to be able to look at every single possible problem and come up with an in-depth solution. So instead, our brain makes use of heuristics or mental shortcuts in order to be able to deal with the problems that we come across. These heuristics typically originate from system one, which also decides how and when to use them. Based on the concept of cognitive ease, our brain either decides to use an intuitive solution or a more in-depth analytical one. Cognitive ease is how easy a piece of information is to process or to understand. So essentially, if the cognitive ease is high, then we typically resort back to an intuitive solution, whereas if the cognitive ease is low or it's a bit more mentally strenuous, then we resort to a more in-depth analytical and system two approach. A good way to see this in action is with the following problem. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball, so how much does the ball cost? If you're like most people, then your system one intuition will immediately kick in and jump to the conclusion that the answer is 10 cents. But if you look at it carefully, i.e. with your system two, then you'll realize that this can't be the solution because the bat costs $1 more than the ball and if you said that the ball cost 10 cents, then that would make the bat cost $1.10, which would make $1.10 plus 10 cents equals $1.20, which is more than the original cost. So in case you haven't worked it out, the correct answer is 5 cents because $1 more than 5 cents is $1.05 plus that 5 cents equals $1.10. The point here is not to do mathematics, but to show that for most people, they would jump to a conclusion depending on its cognitive ease. So this effectively means that if your subconscious is sufficiently confident in your solution, then it will use that solution, which is one generated by system one. But if there's a sufficient level of doubt, then it will resort back to system two to calculate a more precise and accurate answer. Interestingly, this happens regardless of your intelligence and studies have shown that even the best students from the best universities often default to their system one answer, which is often incorrect in these particular experiments. So to summarize this point, system one isn't actually a problem. It's there for efficiency reasons because the sheer number of problems that we come across on a daily basis is too big to be able to deal with each one of them using system two. But it is important to be aware that system one is inherently gullible and biased, whereas system two is typically skeptical and requires evidence. Because of the biased nature of system one, it often jumps to conclusions, which leads to a series of phenomena called cognitive biases and blind spots. I'm now gonna cover some of the most common of these cognitive biases, starting with 
confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is where you already have a belief and you go out looking for information to support this belief while at the same time ignoring any information that contradicts it. This is the basis for many political debates and ideologies and even social media as a whole. For example, when it comes to politics, what often happens if you're either left-leaning or right-leaning is that you go out of your way looking for sources and information that already agree with you. Whereas if you come across something from the opposing view, then you instantly dispute it regardless of its merit. There have also been examples where people have been wrongly convicted for a crime that they didn't do purely because the person who was in charge of convicting them already assumed that they were guilty and therefore went out of their way looking for information that supports this and completely ignores any information that goes against it. So basically only the guilty evidence was accumulated. The next one is the anchoring effect. And this is where you rely on the first piece of information that you come across when forming a conclusion or making a decision. For example, if you were to walk into a shop and you saw a very expensive jacket and you thought that this shop must be very expensive or high quality, but right next to it you saw there was a sale and the cost of another jacket within that sale was very cheap, then you're more inclined to think that you're getting a very good deal from that particular jacket. This is because the piece of information that the first jacket was very expensive kind of distorts your view into thinking that this must be a high quality shop and therefore everything in here is high quality and therefore if you see something cheap it's not due to it being low quality but rather it being an exceptional deal. Another example is if you were to get two groups of people and in the first group you were to ask them is the deepest part of the ocean more or less than three miles deep? And in the second group you ask them is the deepest part of the ocean more or less than 100 miles deep? The particular option that they answer is largely irrelevant. What matters is that if you ask them a follow-up question which is to predict how deep the deepest part of the ocean is, it often skews their particular answer based on what your previous question was. In this case, people from the first group are far more likely to choose a lower estimate than people from the second group. The next one is availability bias, which is the easier something is to remember or how vivid that memory is, the more likely you are to place importance in that memory. For example, if you recall a recent or prominent plane crash, you're more likely to be fearful of being part of a subsequent or future one. This also happens with most traumatic or memorable experiences. Another example is that if your neighbor or someone you knew won the lottery, you're more likely to think or feel that you're capable of winning yourself. Obviously, this doesn't make sense from a rational perspective, but the point is, this is one of those conclusions that your system one jumps to. The next one is the framing effect, and this is where the context in which a problem is presented matters even though it shouldn't. This one is best seen through the example of an experiment, where subjects were asked whether they would opt into a surgery if the survival rate was 90%, whereas another group were asked to do the same thing if the mortality rate was 10%. Even though these two scenarios are completely identical, what matters is the framing around that particular question. The latter one's framing had more negative connotations, so people were more discouraged from saying yes. The next one is the sunk cost fallacy, which is the tendency to persist or follow through with something when you've already invested time, money, or effort into it. This is often despite the fact that pivoting now or backing out is the best choice for that particular person. Some of the most common examples of this is with career and relationships, where you've already made some kind of investment, so it kind of feels counterproductive to back out now, even though you're not happy or there's a clear better choice. The lesson from this one is that it's better to avoid holding on to something that either doesn't serve you or has a net negative effect. And finally, the last one from this list is loss aversion. This is the idea that people are more motivated not to lose something than they are to gain something. Simply put, people would rather not lose $20 than they would find $20. Loss aversion has many implications in the financial world, such that people are less likely to invest in a stock if there's a small chance of losing, even though the potential payoff is really high. So these are six common cognitive biases, and the full list is far more extensive, which includes things such as negativity bias, priming bias, and hindsight bias. It's been proven that we all fall victim to one or more of these cognitive biases at some point in our lives, and the only way to effectively overcome them is to be aware of them. 
The psychological side effects of these ideas run deep through our society and they can often be seen in sales, marketing, advertising and on social media. So whether your goal is to increase your knowledge in psychology or to become more aware of one or more of these industries, it's a good idea to become more familiar with these ideas so that you don't fall victim to them and you don't end up being on the receiving end of people exploiting you through them. So I hope you found this video useful or interesting. If you did, then feel free to subscribe, like, leave a comment down below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.